if people care about that 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 ecosystem, like they actually consider doing the thousand hours. Um, and the second, there's a lot of other things. There's also skill leverage, which means some people's labor uh, drives more value than others. So this is why, for instance, a, a doctor's uh, one hour of a, of a doctor usually is about more valuable than an hour for the janitor. Uh, but of course, the doctors spend a lot of labor driving up the skill set, right? So you'll see that in economies, some people just are more advanced, they, they perform better, or they've been there for longer, and their hour is worth more. Um, and then there's a um, uh, the luck the, the, the luck factor, probability factor, which is about, hey, maybe you're very lucky you play, you, you play this game for an hour and you get this hat that on average you need a thousand hours to, to get, right? So this hat, even though you just spend an hour, it's still worth a thousand hours of labor because if someone else wants to play this game and they, they still have to spend a thousand hours on average to get it, so they would still pay a thousand hours. So then there's things like tradability, liquidity, all those other things, but you want to know that this is the fundamental of economics. And you, a lot of people hear stories about um, Axie Infinity, right? About, oh, you know, people in the Philippines, they're making the above average wage because of this. And it's only because there's a difference in exchange rates, right? So uh, you spend 100 hours in one place, but the other place, you only have to spend two, uh, two hours and you, get that and you get that money, right? So if I spend two hours of my labor wage and I can buy a hundred hours of your time, then it becomes a very good transaction for both sides. Uh, but I think it creates this misconception of people saying, oh yeah, play to earn. Like I can be anywhere. I just play this game. I can make a lot of money. But in fact, most of the time that economy is not very, very good. Um, you know, it, it, imagine that you found a gold mountain, right? And you're mining the gold, right? And you think, hey, it, as long as I mine here, this, this gold, whatever, coin you generate, the token you generate will be valuable. But on the other hand, there are uh, a th like 100,000 13-year-old boys also mining this mountain because it's just fun. They don't even care how much money they, they just mine it for free for fun. You're not going to uh, have a good hourly wage about this, right? Because people do it for entertainment, for intrinsic purposes, right? Intrinsic motivation. They don't even do it to make money. They do it because they feel like there's so much joy. And if they spend a thousand hours and they make like $150, like, yay, hey, you know, I played a game and I made money. But if you did it just to make money, the hourly wage is usually poor. So those are, these are some very important fundamental blocks to to know when we discuss how to create an economy. The other thing is there is the tokens, the currency, but then there's also the goods themselves. So we, let's say a good is a carrot, right? Um, when you, when, there's ecosystem that create more and more tokens and, and, and coins. It doesn't actually create more uh, quote unquote value in the world in terms of produce, right? Think like consumable goods. Um, there's still just 10 carrots in the world, but now instead of you know, 10 types of currency, there's a thousand types of currency. And that those 10, those thousand types of currency are still fighting for that, those 10 carrots. And, and so I hear a lot of people come to me and say, Yukai, we have this you know, uh, like a living community is like, hey, live to earn. You just have to live here and you can earn tokens. You can earn a living because you're living here. And, and so the question is also, you know, who's going to give you money, like pay you to just exist, right? Um, so, so an example I gave out, there's, a, there's something called this, but the random example, let's say there's something called Fartcoin. Um, and in this version of a Fartcoin, whenever you fart, you record it and it generates a fart token, whatever, a fart coin, right? And so, yay, amazing, far to earn, right? Exaggerated example, far to earn, so cool, right? But the question is, who is going to give you that carrot? You know, either it's going to be fiat money, another cryptocurrency that has a conversion to fiat almost, or someone's going to give you that, that end thing, the carrot to you, right? It's unclear. And, and you can do it through storytelling, through building hype, and, and, and everyone thinks it's just going to go up the next month. But ultimately it doesn't necessarily create more value. And, and so this just depends on who, who you can convince next, like who, who can follow the storytelling. I think it's very important to separate the fundamental to the storytelling, the hype and the excitement. Um, so, so, okay, so these things I think are, are building blocks. Now we go into the actual creating sustainable P2P economy. And this goes into stuff we talk about in terms of game loops. Um, so there's a lot of, in gamification, right? We have these kind of simple, 
uh, activities. These are not real game lists. It's like you do, user performs an action, they get some points. After some points, you get free stuff and it ends, right? So it's just a traditional loyalty program. Uh, sometimes you don't get free stuff, you get a badge or you get a you get an NFT that's that looks cool, right? Um, and and uh, sometimes the points and badges separate. But if you look at a game, a simple game, the desired behavior is let's say kill a monster. If you kill a monster, you get EXP, experience points, you get gold, you get treasure chests and loot. Experience points help you level up and become stronger. Gold and treasure chests help you get gear and helps you become stronger and look cool. Now, looking cool is an end. If you want to look even cooler, yeah, you could go back and kill more monsters. It's again, it's activity loop. If you want, you can go back. But becoming stronger actively boosts uh, the activity of killing the monsters, right? Uh, so you, you become stronger, you kill more monsters faster, you get more EXP, gold and treasure chests, you level up, you get more gear, you become stronger. So this is a game loop because by design, it makes people want to go back and do more of it. Because it's kind of stupid if you did all this stuff, you became stronger, and then you quit the game, right? A, a booster is basically a reward, where if you don't do any more desired behavior, the reward is useless, right? And you just motivate to do it. Sometimes a slightly more complex game would have your gear can help you boost your EXP growth, you level up faster, or it helps you get you luck, it makes you luckier, right? You have higher treasure chest probability, magic find, etc. cetera. So um, I, I think a lot of my work, we talk about how to create uh, more intricate uh, experiences and create better economies that have this, this ecosystem that, that people want to go and keep going back to it. This goes to any kind of game where sometimes I have a client that tells me, hey, we're a, we're doing this gamification thing, and uh, but we don't, we can't afford to give people money. So why would they do anything, right? We can't give them good rewards of this and and that. And I said, hey, if you look at a game, most games, not talk counting the play to earn stuff, right? Um, if you look at most games, um, most people don't spend. You know, it doesn't give you any tangible reward. It doesn't give you any money, right? In fact, most people spend money to play the game to to get cooler skins, to get uh, power-ups, to get to level up faster. Um, and so the key thing here is that you need to have an ecosystem where people are spending time to uh, in, in it, in a sense that you want to play the game. Like before you start playing this game, before you're in this activity ecosystem, if they say, hey, sign up today and we'll give you five legendary monsters. You don't even care. You're like, what? If, I don't know what legend It sounds cool, but I don't know what it is. I don't really care. But once you play it, you're like, oh, wow. On a, you know, there are players who play for four years and they only have one legendary and I can just sign up and get five. That's amazing. Everyone's like envious of you, right? You have to be in that ecosystem to really appreciate these, these things in the ecosystem. Uh, but once that ecosystem is someone, something people cares about, then there suddenly is value there. You know, you want to spend a lot of money to buy a skin there or a Gucci bag, a digital version of a Gucci bag there because you care about that community and you care about how other people see you. Just like in the real world, um, you know, a, a, a $40,000 car and a $140,000 car, they do mostly about the same thing, right? They get you from point A to point B. Um, but some people spend an extra $100,000 because they want to impress people. And this is number one, they care about their community. And number two, they want the community to look highly, uh, like uh, respect them, right? So if your ecosystem has that, where people start caring about the community, they care about the activity in the community. Uh, so then they, the, then they care about what called SAPs, status, access, power stuff. I know I'm going through a lot of things real fast. SAPs, right? So you, you care about status. So status to you is a utility, it's something valuable that you would pay for. And and uh, other people, you know, other people would pay for and people respect. You know, access to uh, exclusive experiences, sponsored celebrities, those things people pay for, right? So it's valuable if, when it's given. Um, power, you know, ability to, you know, maybe everyone else has two votes or one vote, but you have two votes because you're a proven member in the community, which is why you see a lot of governments tokens uh, becoming a thing. Even though most government tokens give tokens give you like illusion of governance, like control. Um, you don't really control things. You you choose what the management team allows you to choose, right? And so they they basically decide, like, if you want to eat your broccoli after your rice or before your rice, but you don't get to choose to not eat your eat the broccoli. Um, but yeah, that the, the power gives utility, or you get to level up faster, or whatnot. And then finally, stuff, which is you know merchandise, little uh, rings people can you can send to them. So 
those are important to consider uh, when you're thinking about uh, thinking about the game. This is by the world of Warcraft's game loop, super complex. It's the first game in the world that made a billion dollars. Let's take a let's take a second. We're gonna take a step back, obviously. Yeah, yeah you, let's do it. This is awesome because you're firing a lot of stuff at everybody, and I love it. And then I think what will be really great is if we start putting some context um, around it, specifically to kind of our first point, uh, which is that engagement in the metaverse, right? And and it's something that you and I had actually discussed a few weeks ago, where we said, you know, well, what's really the difference between a game and a metaverse? Right. And I think and I think because the space is so new, a lot of the people on this call are probably even wondering your opinion just to say, you know, if you were to define, you know, a game versus a metaverse, what would be your opinion on that? Yeah, I think the biggest difference in game and a metaverse is actually a metaverse is just the world. And of course, there's a big definition of metaverse, like in, interconnected world where inter interoperability, all that stuff. Uh, but ultimately, if you're looking at the difference. The metaverse is a world where you can, there's no clear objective. Like you don't have to do anything. You can choose to explore and do anything you want. Whereas a game has an objective. Oh, you know, uh, this, this evil bad is trying to destroy the world. And, you know, you can do other side quests, but eventually you need to go there and, and beat the game, right? So usually a metaverse, you can just play, I guess. And a, and a, and a, and a game, there's actually a game that you have to beat. Um, and so if you look at Mark Zuckerberg's version of Metaverse, uh, it's an open world, right? And in the open world, you can play games in it. Um, so, so there's games within the world. And then there's some games uh, that say, hey, we want to be Metaverse. So it's, it's a game like Fortnite that's, meant, that's created for these game rules, shooting each other, but then say, hey, why not we take this game and we make it more open. You can do whatever you want now. Now you can watch concerts. You don't have to shoot people anymore. So I think that's the biggest difference between the two. Yeah, yeah, you know, and you, you bring up a really good point, right? Because I see, we, we see a lot of hype going in with, with, with all these different game five projects, right? And something that we always actively talk about with even our, our clients is that the history of games, right? And, and really that 95% of games over history have failed. And, you know, just having the, the token economics and, and, and blockchain is not going to change that. And, and it's partly as well as what people are asking here, which is, you know, the first thing we were going to talk about, which is what we're talking about, which is how do you actually bring that stickiness to an experience? But I think before we get into that, I think it'd be good for everybody to hear a little bit too about, you know, the autolysis group and your journey uh, from being in crypto, because I know this is not a new space for us. And I think it'd just be good to hear everybody kind of, you know, how we got started earlier on and have been actually um, very in intricate in terms of being a part of the growth. And now that things are really starting to move. Yeah, I did a big background of I guess, myself, which is the founder of the autolysis group. Um, I think I'll just add that um, I discovered that uh, people who are working on Web3 projects, NFTs, they a lot of them read my book. Some of them people say my, my book is a must read. On Twitter, I think three weeks ago, I saw someone tweet that there's two must reads if you have an NFT platform. One is the 22 uh, Immutable Rules of Marketing and the other book is my book, Actionable Gamification. Um, and admittedly, I haven't read the first one, but you know, the joke is, that, oh, it must be really good because they say it's as good as mine. Of course, it's a semi-joke there. Uh, and of course, the Octalysis Group is um, my design and consulting company that was created because of a lot of people reaching out and want my help. And we've grown an expertise on doing this. I'd say 67% of all our, our uh, new projects or current projects are all Web3 projects, not necessarily because there's all these Web3, all the Web3 projects want to come to us. It's, it's kind of because all the companies want to become Web3 companies. And, and so, uh, but they do see us as having the right expert to help them. And so we've uh, just seen a lot of projects like Totem, you know, I have my own Metablocks company and we've seen a lot of pitfalls, things that do go well and not so well. And so that's why um, uh, we find it valuable to share some experience. And the nice thing, it's, it always constantly just builds back into our fundamental framework, the autolysis, because it's about human motivation, right? And when I see how people manage the Discord communities, right, the whitelist, all that stuff, it, it really is these eight core jobs on, on steroids. It's crazy how they manage the scarcity, they manage the unpredictability with the, with the drops and creating the social influence, the community, and sometimes the epic meaning calling and, you know, some of the, like, the cult management stuff comes in place even. So, so it is, you know, I, I think a lot of 
the work we've done in the past, our central framework and uh, what we're doing right now, you know, is very relevant and helps us uh, create value for companies. Yeah. And, and you touch on a really good point. And Mark actually asked this question, right? He's saying, you know, I'm interested in B2B models and I understand the autolysis model and you can see how it motivates individuals, but you just brought up a really good point, right? Oftentimes it's not maybe just that end user individual. And so he's asking, you know, how can this be applied to B2B models? Yeah. So it depends on if you're talking about the autolysis framework or, or the metaverse in general. So they're, they're a, a bit different. Well, this one says uh, but, B2B. That's what Mark's asking, but we'll definitely dive back into the metaverse with some of the other questions coming. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. So B2B, there's, there's really three layers of B2B projects. One is that, uh, is that your your clients are corporations, right? And sometimes it's like government, like, like the carbon credit program is really a B2B. The government creates a, it's actually a G to B to B, government to business to business, right? The government creates a rule where if you're a business that, you know, you use less carbon, you know, you're better for the environment, you can make money from a company that is is hurting the environment and they pay you for your carbon credits, right? That's a that's a G to B to B company experience. So there's there's B to B in general. There's also um, it's B to the person working this uh, in, in the business. So uh, the people there. So if you're selling analytics platform, right, to to another company, it's B to B. But ultimately, the person who's using the the product is the employees who's going through using this analytics tool. And so um, the stuff all applies, right? The analytics tool, a lot of people still fo- look at function focused design saying, hey, people are motivated to use our platform. And then we just maximize efficiency on features, right? But we know that all of them are human beings. And most of the time they'll say like, oh, now our company forces to use this, this super bloated analytics platform has 200 features. I don't want to use it. It sucks, but I don't want to lose my job, so I'm doing it, right? So there's definitely a lot of room to make that experience better, motivate people, make people want to use the product, which in turn translates to long-term success. That's number two. Number three is uh, B2B2C, which is you are providing solution to companies so they can provide to their customers, right? So like I used to run a a restaurant loyalty program. uh, That's B2B2C, right? We sell to restaurants, but they use the loyalty program for their customers, and so there's a variety of these, these things that they all have different ways to design, implement, and execute on. So, but those are at least, uh, you know, it sets out, a, a, it carves out the playing field to say that B2B is relevant for the stuff we're talking about. Right, great. No, that, that's, that's amazing. And, and, and I, think, I think what people, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm fielding some of these questions and I'm getting a feeling <coughs> where, you know, where sometimes gamification and games it themselves get, get confusing, right? Because a lot of people say, oh, we're, you know, we're going to have games here. So therefore we are using gamification. And, 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 and Pookie makes a point, right? Saying, you know, I know you're talking about that first person kind of view of the metaverse and avatar and looking at kind of what kind of activities do you think will bring stickiness to the metaverse? Um, but I, and I, and I think, you know, obviously from my perspective, it's really saying, you know, well, what do you like to do in real life, <laughs> right? Like, what do you like to, what, what actually do you enjoy doing in real life? And, and really seeing how that translates into the, the metaverse itself. But yeah, just to kind of take a swing on, on that where, you know, what are you, in your opinion, would be certain things in, in, in a metaverse that, that would make it sticky? Obviously, we don't have user types, we don't have player types, so it's, everything's different. But, but yeah, kind of just drilling that point home that the metaverse is, is to be that, that same hangout that we have right now. And that's why I keep the screen open because pretty much every answer I fall back to the octalysis framework. Yeah. So <laughs> to make an experience sticky, a, a lot of it is really about the right brain core graph intrinsic motivation. Um, basically, for instance, if you go to a place um, and you just feel appreciated, you just want to be there more often, right? I, I talk to a lot of clients that one of the lowest hanging fruits you can do for any project is make it easy for people to show appreciate for each other. Because every, almost everyone, everywhere they go, they feel underappreciated, right? At home, at school, at work. And so if they just, again, suddenly go to a place that they just feel appreciated by others, they just want to be there. It doesn't matter if it's a book club, a poker club, the game they play at home. Uh, they just want to go there more often. So I think for it to have stickiness, there needs to be an environment of not just collaboration, but so like you feel like, oh, people need me here. This is why you see when people play like World of Warcraft, they're in some guild. 
uh, and they're just, they're playing a lot in the family's like, Hey, you know, it's your child's birthday, or whatever. Right. It's like, no, no, I have to do this guild thing. I have to do this, this, uh, this raid, you know, because my team needs me. Right. It's like, no, your family needs you. Right. It's like, no, no, they need me because they need a healer. <laughs> right. If no, without a healer, all 25 people fail for sure. Right. And it's like this person, I'm not a recommended behavior. Right. But I'm, but this person obviously feels like he's more appreciated in the guild, interestingly enough, and he wants to be there. Right. And um, so, so the thing is that you want, you want people to feel like they're appreciated, how to create that community, not comp so social influence in the middle. Right. So it could be white hat, which is about collaboration and, and uh, social appreciation gifting, but it could also be black hat, which is more about competition, you know, peer pressure. So a lot of projects that like to do competition stuff. Uh, but like I said, it could easily burn people out, uh, you know, for every, one winner that could be a hundred losers. So it, it needs to be used in small bursts, not a consistent culture there. Um, if you can somehow always uh, create that sense of unpredictability and curiosity, there's always something new. Uh, there's delightful surprises. I think people wanna be there more, but it's hard because it's hard to create something that constantly new, right? The best people can do is, oh, there's a loot box that every time you open it, there's something new, which is why social goes back to become very important because every person there gives you a brand new experience. They'll tell you different things. They'll give you something different. So it's almost people and the community is the, the engine that drives a lot of unpredictability too. I think the biggest thing is empowerment of creativity and feedback. One of the biggest things it's on the right top. So it's white hat, intrinsic, long-term, our brains enjoy it, right? Um, and it's just really getting people to start to express and they'll feel a, a empowered. There's autonomy. Um, I think it's a sticky, it's a sticky metaverse and web three project. If people spend a lot of time just even pulling out spreadsheets to how to optimize for this, how to look the best, how do I uh, do these things? So it's not a linear path. I just showed a game loop, right? Most experience are linear, but if it's like intricate, it's all connect to each other, then there's strategy. And that's what makes it really, really sticky. Um, and of course, in the long term, underlying, there needs to be some kind of meaning and purpose. Like people feel like, uh, after five years of doing this, you shouldn't think, oh, I like spent 50, uh, 5,000 hours just like shilling, shilling a picture and just talking about how, how, how we're going to rich, right? It doesn't feel as mean. I have a friend who worked for a VC company and he realized he could be making more money every day just by playing poker. So he actually quit his job at a VC company and he started playing poker every day. And he actually did make money every day. But six months, he, he, he went back to working because he did feel like, he's like, what am I doing with my life? Just playing poker, gambling all day long. And, and he feels like it lacks meaning, right? So he so goes back to the, hey, you could be shilling, you could be making money off of these NFT projects, but for long-term sustainability, there needs to be some kind of meaning and purpose behind this NFT project. Like, um, you know, how is humanity better because your project exists? And that creates lasting value and people always feel good about it. They don't, it's not like they watch five seasons of, of something on Netflix and they feel like, oh, I just wasted my time. Right. It's like, wow, I watched five seasons of these documentaries. I'm an enlightened person now. Um, so that means more. So this keep in mind, this is clear in this framework. Right. But most companies don't do that. Most companies fall onto the left side. They just said, hey, the activities are kind of boring. They're linear. But if you do this boring thing a thousand times, hey, we'll give you a badge. We'll have you level up. We'll give you achievement. We'll give you very scarce titles. Right. They focus on the left brain quarter. And it's almost like a game where you first create the game. And then at the last step, you figure out how to make it fun which makes no sense. And if you do this boring game, play this boring game a thousand times, you'll get rewarded, right? It doesn't make any sense. You want to make the game itself interesting and engaging. And that's how you have stickiness. Great. Yeah. That makes it really, really, really good. We're, we're going to, we're going to just switch a little bit from the, the metaverse chat, just because uh, of Jerry here, just kind of, you know, and it's something that we've done a lot of, so I think it'll be an easy answer, but in terms of looking at how do we use this model and gamif gamification in business and corporate environments? right? Where sometimes there's that uh, explicit versus implicit gamification that a lot of these uh, corporate clients need to be versed in that, yeah, it's not always just about making it this gamey, cartoony feel. Uh, there can be a lot more to it, actually. Yeah. So I think this goes into the, uh, the concept of what, what you're talking about, implicit versus explicit uh, gamification. And let's see if I have a convenient slide right here. Nope. So I'll like go to the bigger slides. Um, yeah, so implicit or explicit. So gamification has a lot of different terminologies and some people say, oh, this is a serious game, all this stuff. So what we have, I like to 
interpret the role of simple models, right? And just fall on the model for every time. So I have a spectrum called implicit versus explicit gamification. Explicit side, it's basically, it feels like game, plays a like game, it's gameful, magical, people can opt in or opt out of it. Um, and so if you look at this one on the right, it looks like a kind of like a futuristic car game, right? You have a car avatar in a futuristic city. Uh, this is actually a loyalty program my company, the Arcalis Group, designed for Porsche in, in Europe. So the to play this game and have this effort, you actually need to own a Porsche. Um, and, and then based on how you drive the Porsche and how you interact with other Porsche owners who have the app, uh, you can unlock some a variety of rewards and allows you to upgrade to your next car in the Volkswagen family more easily because they also have beyond Porsche, they have uh, Bentley, they have you know even higher end cars, right? Uh, like Bugatti. And and the one on the right feels even more like a game. There's like an NPC character that has dialogue. There's like currency and coins. This was a a, 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 a CRM system uh, for a door to door. Uh, restaurant technology. So they're the biggest tech, um, open table technology if you're from the US, uh, in Europe. So if, the US, uh, if you're from Europe, then it is what it is. Uh, they were sold to a Japanese company for $800 million, I think. But basically, their salespeople have to go door to door, knock on restaurants and say, hey, buy our, buy our software, buy our software. So that's a little bit of B2B right there. Um, and as they do desire the KPI activities, they'll get resources to build their city and get stuff. Uh, and as they close deals, they'll get even more. So, you know, that's, again, looks like a game. But then we have and, and on the know, left sorry, side. You, I, think, I think it's something to note that, you know, obviously me coming from a corporate environment that a lot of business leaders in the corporate environment, you know, think, well, if they're just playing a game, then they're not going to do their work. But I think, I think the real transformation for myself even understanding was that there's really a choice that we're really ushering in and kind of our core drive one, which is saying, you know, we do believe that work can be, actually fun and still be actually the person can be effective and do their job better because of the structure of how the work is actually presented. Yeah. So this goes into our strategy dashboard. Um, again, big slide. Um, the strategy dashboard, we have a five-step design process. Not going to go into detail, but um, yeah. So we define in every project, what are the business metrics? Who are the place? What are the desired actions? Right. And right. the key thing is if, if it does not increase your business metrics, then then it's a wasted project, right? It's it's just a game. A game is just fun in itself, and people can spend a thousand hours on it. It's great. Gamification exists to create external business value. People are buying stuff. People are exercising more. They're building better relationships. And if that business metric does not go up, then this is a whole this whole thing's a failure, right? And and we've seen clients who want to say, hey, what about do this mini game? And it's like, yeah, it's fun. People can spend time in it, but it really doesn't improve your business metric. And so if you look at that example of the CRM, right? Some people look at that and say, oh, but isn't it bad that our salespeople are playing this, this game that building their city and, and listening to this virtual character say things. Well, you have to realize that if you don't sell to a restaurant, you just can't play the game. You can't even do the first step of the game, right? So good gamification design is that, you know, to, to enjoy yourself, to and be engaged, you really need to do the desired behavior that, that builds value. But then we have implicit gamification, which are things that are clean, efficient, it's invisible. You don't really feel like it's a game. You just It just has emotional nudges to make you feel again, appreciated, feel progression, all that stuff. So this is the uh, eBay seller's dashboard that we help eBay design. It's just to motivate you know, their sellers to be more professional. No one's, go on, go, no one's gonna go onto this platform or go on LinkedIn, let's say, and say, oh, they're trying to make me play a game. I don't want to play a game, right? And then you have all the way in the spectrum, right? You have something in the middle, like Waze, where it doesn't, clearly it's not a game. It's a navigation app, but then it's also very playful. It looks like there's a lot of game elements in it. So uh, there's that variety of, of things we, uh, uh, we think about when we're looking at engaging uh, behavior in, in any context, whether metaverse or not. Gotcha. No, oh, that's great. That's great. Um, one of the ones that here <clears throat> that uh, that people are talking about, obviously, from that just to just to round out this the kind of the work slash employee part of it. How do we see that translating now into the metaverse? You know, what are people going really, like? What could work really look like inside the metaverse? Yeah, I think this goes back into what I what I started like is I guess I I jump very very fast within things, right? Um, 
I think for the metaverse, it, it is the same, right? Because we were talking about how the brain works. And one thing that's important is the brain doesn't necessarily care about um, how these core drives are delivered. Uh, we just care about that they are triggered. So uh, it doesn't matter if it's like an email. It doesn't matter if it's like a, like a 2D game, a 3D game, virtual world metaverse. Um, the key is whether these eight core drives exist. So we could feel super, super uh, con socially connected to someone through an email touch, even while they sacrifice our lives through email, right? And we could be in 3D virtual world and be like, besides the beginning in a like nov novelty, which is core drive seven unpredictability, we're like, okay, well, sure. Like, I think I'm good. Thanks. Right. Because there's, there's no other core drives hitting us. And, and so all these, these technologies are mediums to deliver those eight core drives. Of course, if you have more advanced technology, there's a higher opportunity to deliver those. You can create more unpredictable. You can, you can create a, a, a stronger sense of scarcity, right. In terms of blockchain, whatnot. And so I think, uh, when we think about web three in the metaverse, and I think some of you mentioned about NFTs more. So, when I did a, a study about NFT, and this is the reason why I started Metablocks in the first place, um, NFTs are, are, are valuable for because of three, three core drives, really. Uh, scarcity, right? I think hopefully people are somewhat well-versed in this stuff. So um, instead of being copied infinitely, um, you know, it's a unique copy. It's like a signed book. I could have, you know, I, I, sold, I think my book sold over 100,000 copies. But maybe I think I've signed 200 to 300 copies, right? So those two or 300, I guess they're unique and uh, non so there's scarcity there. And then the other 100,000, they can print more and more and more, but then they're all the same. They're fungible uh, as long as you have the text. So, and which is why my PDF, you know, could be the same as a, as a, as a printout book, right? If you just care about the words, the knowledge, but some people say, no, I want to have the book. So now slightly differentiated note there, I want a signed book. Um, now the problem with a lot of project is that it's, it's still arbitrary scarcity. So it's like, Hey, the company can just print more, mint more if they want to. Uh, it almost is a little bit like the government saying that we just want to print out more fiat cash. Um, <clears throat> so, but the scarcity is there that makes NFTs. So, so the more legitimacy on the scarcity, like people believe that, Hey, you're not going to create more just like we trust. If we could trust our government to say, they're not going to print out more, more cash then there's more scarcity, right? But sometimes, you know, it depends on who you're, if, if the organization is trustworthy in their thesis. But I think very importantly, there's, we need that meaning and purpose. So that creates value in NFTs. So I have a friend in Denmark, he owns a very rugged broken couch, uh, but he cherishes it dearly because it used to be Winston Churchill's couch. And he considers Winston Churchill war hero. So even though it has no utility, right? It, it doesn't really do much. And it's not even that good at cosmetic wise. It's highly valuable. Um, so that's the meaning part. And you want to think about, again, your NFT project. What's the meaning behind it? Is it just a, a gag, a funny thing, or, or something that looks kind of cool? Or does it have a deeper meaning behind it? If we're, look, if we're really looking at what's going to survive five to 10 years from now, right? I think that's very important. Oh, another thing it's, I, I want to bring up is nowadays, lots of companies doing NFTs. And as people know, the prices are, a lot of prices are over high. And they're like, oh, this might be a bubble. It might crash. Um, and I do believe valuations can't be overhyped, but the tech, the fundamental technology of blockchain and NFT is very strong, just like the dot-com bubble, right? Dot-com, when the dot-com bubble burst, dot-com did not fail. It was the valuation, the financing, the exuberance that failed. People realized, oh, wait, this, this thing, is this dot-com is, this website is not worth $10 billion. It's only worth a hundred million dollars. Oh crap. And we got to sell, sell, sell. And then it goes bankrupt. Right. And the thing is that, well, it's, it's pretty amazing that a website is worth a hundred million dollars to begin with, right? And, and so, and dot-com, the, the technology, the trend did not stop during the dot-com burst, right? The company that survived, you know, now we know that today the top 100 websites are hugely, hugely valuable. Some of the most valuable things on the, on the, on, on the planet, right? And I think NFT is going to be the same thing. There's going to be this exuberance. It's probably going to go even higher of hype and financing and money, and then at one point, people is like, oh, well, actually, this is not worth, you know, $200,000, this, this one NFT. And then it crashed. But then when it crashed, then the ones that do have that lasting value would float above the crowd and, uh, and say like, hey, uh, you know, we, we're meaningful. We're here to stay for the next 20, 50, 100 years. And those end up being very valuable. So meaning is very, very important. You want to think about what is the epic meaning calling in your project? And how do you motivate 
your audience in that. And then finally, it's community, right? If, if uh, back to my friend's couch example, if there's, if my friend's the only person in the world who, who likes Winston Churchill, then the couch is immensely valuable to him, but he can't really sell it for it to anyone else, right? But if there's a community of 100,000 people all believing uh, Winston Churchill as a war hero, he knows that he can sell the couch to someone else who can probably sell it to someone else for even higher. So, so that's why when you think about NFTs, it's really about how do you have believable scarcity? How do you have really strong and soul-touching epic meaning and calling? And how do you build and drive a community that cares, that shows appreciation for each other, and, and just they just want to thrive in that community? And that becomes the metaverse of, hey, this is our, our camp and we want to be here. So I, I think when you're thinking about designing NFTs and the meta, web through metaverse, these are things that you really want to care about. And then, and then at that point, you can think about you know, perks or utility, like, hey, if you have this NFT, you can come to my club for free or you get access to me. You get to watch a movie like Kai Lopez, if you know him. Uh, you get to watch a movie. If you buy my $10,000 NFT, you get to watch a movie with me once a year. I you know, access, whatever. Um, then you think about what are the perks. But those are the three fundamental things uh, that you want in your project when you're doing Web3 stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, we're here. One more before we, we start to kind of just talk a little bit about where we're going to be at the end of the week. And But this is one I think that will be interesting. It's a little on the other side. How can Octolysis model be applied to engaging people to take more sustainable actions or choose to participate in positive climate behaviors? Yeah, so uh, it's back to the strategy dashboard. So uh, our projects are like all, all these places, right? Healthcare, education, uh, banking, insurance, sustainability, motivating kids to eat healthily, motivating Jewish people to uh, be more faithful to their God. And there's no possible way we can be an expert in any one of these fields. Um, we can, however, be experts in how, you know, how to drive motivation, how to motivate people. So, so that's why we always fall back to that strategy dashboard that I showed. Right? As long as you can tell me what the business metrics are, players have desired actions, and then obviously, and then we have talked about FIBA mechanics that should be triggers, Wednesday moments and rewards, we can design engaging experiences. And, and so um, it's hard. But every project needs to go back to defining into, you need a player type and a desired action. So if you want this type of people to do more of this desired action, then we can help design it. So if someone says, hey, how do we solve world hunger? Well, I don't know, because I'm not an expert in world hunger, because there's no player type and there's no desired action. If you say, oh, how do you get Americans to donate food to third world countries every day? Then that I can work on, right? Because there's a player type, there's a desired action, and we can use the A4 drives to motivate them to the desired action. Uh, whether that's, uh, or, or you can say, how do we get um, uh, people in third world countries to have better sanitation, right? Wash their, wash their food every morning. Now, whether any of these solve world hunger or not, I have no idea. That's not my expertise, but I can drive behavior. So when you think about sustainable changes and, uh, you know, uh, or changing the world for sustainable causes and uh, having, you know, pollute less or having cleaner water behavior and all that stuff, right? You, you do have to boil it down to, uh, we want people, you could be just general people overall, or you can, your design becomes better and more precise if you can uh, create a more precision, like this, this target audience, uh, so you can make it perfect for them. Uh, and we want them to do this, right? A list of desired actions. Oh, one of my clients, uh, Ocean Hero. So they're a search engine, uh, where every time you uh, you do a um, you do a search with their search engine, they they pick up a, a plastic bottle in the ocean, ocean hero, yeah. And I remember when I first worked with them, they on their website they showed we had two million bottles picked up, right? And they wanted to get a lot of gamification, storytelling, all that stuff. And last time I checked, yeah, it's twenty six million now. So they have actively made a really big difference to the ocean, like twenty six million plastic bottles have been picked up because people are using the search engine. And this is epic meaning calling design, right? You can search it anywhere, but, but here, and some say, hey, if you search without engine, we'll give you some money. At the end of the month, we'll give you two more dollars, right? And it's like, I don't care about those two more dollars. I I'd rather search on an engine that actually uh, uh, feeds poverty or, you know, cleans up the ocean. And they do have, you know, leveling up stuff and group quests and all those things. So uh, yeah, it's a, uh, Again, it's on, I, I can't tell you right now in like three minutes how to solve all the, every problem in your, your, your project, but that's why we have a framework and methodology to lean on. And so either I encourage you to learn the methodology, I have, you know, read my book and I'll do that stuff. And of course, uh, if you don't want to 
do that for a long time, then of course you can uh, uh, ask us to help you too. Definitely, definitely. Well, we have about five minutes left and I think it'd be great to just, you know, let everybody know um, yeah, you know, this metaverse space, this NFT space, this Web3 space is definitely evolving. It's changing every day. And, and kind of like you guys said, you know, one of the things that's really different about us is that we've been around for a decade and it really goes back to human motivation, right? It goes to human core drives where at the end of the day, whether in person, digital, on your phone, through social media platforms, on an e-commerce platform, at work, uh, in a training session, if you're dealing with humans, then one of the values that the autolysis framework brings is just that clarity into what core drives are you using or, or are being enacted to get these desired actions done. So I think it's really exciting that there's so much going on in this space. And yeah, basically, why don't we just spend a couple minutes here, tell them a little bit about Metablocks, tell them about we're going to be in Miami. Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully we can meet up with some people that are on this uh, in this call today. Yeah, so a big thing that's going on in the... Uh... The Web3 world is there's the uh, NFT Week Miami, and uh, you know I'll be a speaker there. Um, Mark Cuban will be there too. So I'm actually speaking at two conferences in Miami. There's another one called NFT Con right after. Uh, so if you are going to this thing, um, uh, you know, feel we'd love love to meet up and talk more about random things. We're about Web3 and Metaverse or anything else you want. We're actually for my MetaBlocks project. We actually are sponsoring some influencers to do it. And, and so Metablox is actually interesting because it, it just became my own thing after I observed so many projects going on. And uh, we talk about create, creating epic meaning and calling, right? And it's really attaching these high level themes that again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. I know it's just been a lot of like blasting information, but again, there's a lot to cover as you can tell and I'm very passionate about all of it. Um, but when we talk about the idea of scarcity, meaning and, uh, and social influence, and I was thinking about, okay, well, what has true scarcity in the real world, right? There's gold and there's real estate, but gold is fungible, right? My gold and your gold be trade, it's the same thing. But houses, homes, they're not, they're non-fungible, right? Your home and my home, even if they're the exact same dimension, they're totally different. They're at different locations. They would have different memories that come with it. Uh, you know, my, the, the place that I had my first child or the basketball court, Michael Jordan practice, Steve Jobs garage. So we thought, hey, wouldn't it be useful if we saw nfts you know we talked about the scarcity needs to have believability right if nfts represent real life locations so that's the first premise of metablocks uh they're based on real life places and there's a few projects out there that also do it and it's like hey you get to buy with ethereum the nft of the the, the, the statue of liberty whatnot but we want to record our one epic meaning and calling right talk about that's the most important thing and we thought about why why should a project be on the blockchain Right, because there's a lot of projects out there, like in the ICO days, and it's like we just we don't know we, we don't we just want on the blockchain. We want a token. We want a coin. We want we want, to, we want that money, or we want to be cool, edgy. Uh, but what does the blockchain actually bring to? And what we've thought about is the blockchain actually allows us to store our memories forever. So my co-founder who uh, of MetaBlocks, who who's out from Google, he said like one day he was surprised that Google uh, Photos said they'll start charging him monthly fees. It's like, oh, of course, they're a company, right? And he realized all his memories are on Google Photos. So if, you know, after like 50 years, his children's grandchildren, what if they stop paying for Google Photos? Or what if Google decides to shut it down? Then all his memories are lost. But on the blockchain, they can be uploaded to the blockchain. And it's in, theoretically, you can be forever on blockchain and no one company can shut it down. So the idea is that you own these blocks that represent physical location, but then you have to level them up by uploading meaningful memories that represent the location. And then, then we build a community around that. So that's, that's Metablocks. Again, a lot of stuff to say about it. But uh, so doing that and just sharing about uh, things I'm sharing to you today, but also other things about Metablocks, how, you know, things about imbuing meaning to a project. Yeah, this whole space, I think, it's really, really exciting. I think it's definitely, I think we're definitely, definitely at the really, really early stages. You know, this is like 1994 for the, for the internet. You know, it's like people are still kind of figuring out what is, what do you do with NFT? Is it just a JPEG or can we do more? Can we do more with smart contracts, right? I think people are just kind of figuring out and a lot of early projects will still not be profitable with DAI, but so I, I recommend the key thing is to keep learning, growing, learning, growing. And if you're lucky, you have the, the big, big projects, then yeah, I think, if you, if you stand through the times, it'll be super lucrative. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you nailed it right there that we're super early. And I think the people that are in it might feel that uh, things are running real fast and they're gonna miss things. But 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we just obviously want to send out an open invite that if anybody wants to talk about their specific, um, you know, projects or ideas that they have, different things, yeah, feel free to just reach out to us. You'll obviously uh, have the email reply from myself, Matt, at octolysisgroup.com. And, yeah, happy to chat about anybody's projects. And, and Heidi, I see you there that you're going to be in Miami as well. So definitely send me some info and we'll see if we can all link up and go from there. So yeah, just want to wrap up by saying thanks everybody for spending your lunchtime with us. I don't know where around the world you might be. It might not be your lunchtime, might be your midnight, might be your afternoon or evening. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much. And then of course, connect with us through LinkedIn. If you have any other questions or things going on, uh, we're going to be getting to, to have a little bit more of a series of these types of conferences and, and, and webinars and fireside chats uh, going forward. So Keep out, uh, you know, and, on top of the LinkedIn and, and we'll definitely be sending a recording as well, I believe, of this. So, yeah, we'll go from there. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Uh, it was our pleasure and we will talk to you soon. See you later. Bye-bye. Take care.